him today. Let's go ahead and get started. So welcome to the Bridge Club. We're really happy that you're here. Um, Catherine Haskins, and I, it's Catherine in the maybe upper right-hand corner. I'm not sure exactly where she is on your screen. <laughs> we created the Bridge Club um, to connect and inspire people over really good conversations. So it's kind of a TED Talks meets a LinkedIn plus a good old-fashioned book club where we bring some interesting conversations to the table and we hope that each of you will have the opportunity to participate in this conversation and to connect with each other, engage with each other, and then learn and grow throughout the process too, both um, professionally and personally. So for those of you who are new, we do things a little differently around here. Um, the session is being recorded. We make this available to our all access members after the session. Um, and we do want to hear from you, okay? So to, if there's noise in your background, please mute yourself, but speak up, raise your hand, ask a question. Catherine and I will be watching for you and um, we'll call on you, you know, when there's a little bit, bit, bit of break in the action. And also you can also personal chat us and we can ask the question for you if you don't want to ask it yourself, all right? so. Most importantly, turn on your video camera and I'm really pleased with how everybody's um, agreeing to do that so far because we really do want that engagement, okay? Um, go to the upper right hand corner of your screen and you will see a gallery view. That will enable you to see everybody's faces who's participating. So it's kind of fun to be able to watch, watch everybody um, as we talk. Okay, so our host today is Dr. Kimberly Pope Robinson. She is the leader of, well, a leader in the profession's awareness of the importance of self-care and has a lot of really terrific lessons for each of us to learn here. So her One Life Connected approach, um, many of you may have heard of it, is really teaching professionals like us in the veterinary profession to reconnect with what's important to ourselves and our lives. And we're really thrilled she's here today with the Bridge Club. So grab your beverage and Dr. Kimberly Pope Robinson, take it away. Great. So uh, we always started off with a toast. So I have my cup and I would just like to say mine says San Diego on it. <laughs> so one of the things that I believe in with One Life Connected is I um, also try and minimize my effect on planet Earth. And so one of the things I do is I have my own mugs that I carry with me. And this is one of my favorite ones. So I brought it down for today. And I love the fact that we, even though we can't physically be together, I mean, we were just talking someone's in Oregon, someone's in Chicago, someone's in Philadelphia, I'm in San Diego. This helps us to actually have the ability to see each other and have conversations versus it all being on our devices. So I thank you guys for creating the Bridge Club. I think it's a great idea. And I toast to all of us who have come this morning to engage on this topic. So have a drink. Cheers. Cheers. And so just a little bit of a background about me in case you don't know who I am. So I am a veterinarian. I graduated from Davis in 2000. And I've worked in a variety of aspects within the veterinary industry. But before I even went into vet school, I actually was an HR planned track. So uh, business based. And I didn't like that track, so I realized I like science better, and that's how I ended up going into vet med. So I didn't even know I wanted to be a veterinarian. It's my second year in college. I ended up graduating and going into equine medicine, and then I had some health issues that developed, and I went to small animal. I had the health issues continue to develop, and I was no longer able to practice, so I went into leadership. I was a multi-unit manager, which is kind of ironic. I ended up in HR, even though I was a veterinarian. And I had about originally 120 veterinarians that reported to me, then eventually 60. And then I left that to go work for pharma. And I worked as a regional strategic veterinarian for a large pharmaceutical company where I only work for specialty hospitals and colleges of veterinary medicine. Now, the point to my history is I have a very broad exposure to the industry. I've worked in large, I've worked in small, I've worked in general practice, I've also worked in specialty practice, I've worked in industry, I've worked as a manager, I have pretty much private practice, corporate practice, I've got the gamut of it. And what I found is there's a lot of struggle no matter where we go, right? And so it's not one thing that's better than another. And I also got really good at engaging with people in this space. And I got to be known as the emotions girl. And so I started to get a lot of requests when I was in my last position uh, with the pharmaceutical company to help talk about compassion fatigue or engagement or all the 
emotional crap that we never talk about. And I started One Life Connected. So I walked away from complete financial freedom and started this movement. And that's really what this is. And what I say for people is One Life Connected creates the space that gives us permission to find our unique path to sustainability. Now, before we get really diving into the core concepts of One Life, I wanted to automatically just throw a question out to the group. And the question is, when you're thinking about well-being, whether it's your own or other people's, whether it's in this industry or not, what is the biggest barrier that you see that limits people in able to embracing well-being? This is the time for people to speak up. <laughs> and Catherine and I can't answer because we know the answer to this question. Guesses? Yeah. Um, I'm going to go with financial fear. Financial fear? Like, like um, can you elaborate on that a little bit so I just understand? Um, it's the middle class pro problem of golden handcuffs, right? That what I'm doing is paying for what I do, so therefore... You can go ahead and not be in the picture, honey, because they can see you. That's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Kids are allowed. Kids are allowed. It's okay. <laughs> so trying to do something different, you know, you can't get past that, what you jumped into. So kind of like the, the cultural societal stigma that you have to work, you have to make money. And if you don't keep that focus, that you're basically going to be homeless and living on the street and begging for money. <laughs> kind of? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. And I agree with that, although I think that's taking it a little too far. I mean, we all have responsibilities and, you know, we're res we feel that responsibility very deeply, I think. And part of it is taking care of our families. So making sure they have groceries and, a, you know, can turn on the water and there's water coming up the tap and that kind of thing. But I, I find I worry a lot about things that I have no control over. And that's one of my hard things to give up. So there's, there's definitely responsibility and I agree with you. It's not like we can just toss everything to the wind. Even though I walked away from financial security, I made sure I could pay my bills, right? Um, but that ambiguity, the unknown, and also not being able to know how to verbalize that space of the unknown, that's a common one that comes up. And just the, um, the, the ambiguity, that's the best word probably for it. And not being able to have control over that. Who else? No one? Debbie, Diane, I know you all have opinions on this. <laughs> well, we'll start from there. Um, so, so one of the biggest barriers I found was language. The ability to ha have control over this. Time, stigma, culture, societal beliefs of what we're supposed to be. And so that was one of the reasons why I started One Life was to give us a language to start from. And what the framework, what does is it helps people to be able to visualize themselves within it. Now, some of you guys have heard me talk about it. And, and for those of you who don't, basically I talk about it as we, we live above this ocean of shame, this place where we feel unworthy of acceptance and belonging. We have all these sinkers that are trying to pull us into that ocean. But at the same time, we're holding these four balloons, our well-being balloons, our mental, spiritual, physical, and emotional balloons. And they're very unique to how we fill them. And then same are the sinkers. And so when you're talking about responsibilities, it's not that that's a bad thing, but there could be a responsibility of paying for your child's college education or having debt, whether it's home debt, student debt, car debt. It could be all those journals that you don't read that pile up that you can't throw away because if you throw them away, that means you're a bad whatever that journal covers. And so you end up having seven years of JAVMA and you can't toss them away. It could be clients coming in with no money. It could be Dr. Google telling everyone coconut oil fixes the world. It could be Yelp reviews, whether that's related to your business or something that you are passionate about, like a nonprofit group. 
It could be a number of different sinkers, our own personality traits. I'm a perfectionist, so I like to control things as too. So being um, in that ambiguity place was really hard for me. And so one of the things we really talk about is giving that language back to the people. And so oftentimes people will talk about, oh, that was a sinker. And now they have, they have language that they can associate with that, or I need to go fill a balloon, or that was a balloon that I just felt. And that allows them to be able to speak in a space where they're not necessarily comfortable speaking. It also normalizes it to, to look at it and say, hey, listen, we do have these responsibilities and we're not saying we're ignoring them because we shouldn't get rid of the sinkers. We actually need them and they're driving us a lot. It's learning how to hold them and our balloons at the same time. Because what often happens is when you start sinking and you fall into that ocean, You'll, you'll, you'll feed this name, blame, judge serpent that swims in there and loves negativity and, and anger and hate. And we feel good initially when that happens, but it doesn't take us to a good place. And so the other path is what's called recognize, embrace, connect. And it's to recognize that we have an emotion associated with our sinker, whatever that might be. We embrace it and then we find a way to stay connected. And that's connecting to both the sinker and the balloon. So one of the big challenges I came across, and actually Debbie and I were talking about this at AVMA recently when we met up, was get, making it accessible for the industry, for anybody to talk in this space. So as we recognize this framework, there's continued struggle to people potentially still making that step in order to stay connected. And one of the things I would love for you guys to think about and kind of share is we recognize that we're not alone when we have this language. We recognize that we're not broken, but yet what do you think still continues to stop people from taking that next step? Fear of change. Fear of change, yeah. Change is, change is something that, I know this status quo, so I always explain it like, when I went, when I, when I, when I started my life, I had this like plan of what the world was gonna be, right? Like I was gonna go to, I was gonna get into undergrad, I was gonna graduate from undergrad school, and then I was gonna get into vet school, and then I get into vet school, and then I'm gonna finish first year, second year, third year, fourth year, I get, I graduate vet school, and I'm climbing this mountain, right? And I'm expecting that happiness is gonna be at the top of the mountain. And I'm like, okay, I got through vet school, so now I'm gonna go get an internship, I'm gonna get my training job, I finish that, you know, happiness is gonna be at my next job, my dream job, and then I get my dream job and I get to the top of the mountain and all I see is more mountains. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't, it's like, it doesn't really stop. <laughs> so um, the change is kind of moving away from this idealistic um, vision of what we had life was going to be, regardless if it's becoming a veterinarian or just living ourselves. I'm going to get married and then I'm going to do this and then I know that. And then you follow this path and then, you get to the top thinking everything's going to be great and you realize it's not. And so that change is scary. And, and, and that's part of it is that we thought we could control what everything was going to be. And now we're being forced to go into a place of comfort of change. And um, I do come across that quite a bit. And I think that's one of the reasons the framework has been helping is that it allows people to recognize that as they grow and move and change in their career, the sinkers change and so do the balloons, but the framework stays throughout. And so they're able to use that as they navigate the different aspects of change. What other, what other things do you think come up a lot when I, when I talk with, with people in this space of stopping them from actually beginning their own well-being pattern? Like I think for me, a lot of it is feelings of just being overwhelmed and not knowing where to start. And so when you have this giant mountain ahead of you, where, where do you place the first step? And so that for me has been a challenge uh, to overcome 
on my career path. And you know, obviously you take enough steps and then it gets easier and easier. Yeah, that, that overwhelming feeling is a common theme that will come up as well. So you're not alone, but you're also unique in that path. And I think that's one of the reasons why the framework helps is that the different sinkers will also be unique to you as well in what, what may overwhelm you. So you may, and that's one of the things I recognize is I would go to lectures and they would basically tell me all the things I'm supposed to do, right? Like you're, you're, you're supposed to eat right you're supposed to exercise, you're supposed to do yoga, you're supposed to meditate, you're supposed to fill in whatever, you know, be financially independent, be this and that. And then I'd walk out of there with all these great ideas and then I'm overwhelmed with the number of things I'm supposed to do. And then I make absolutely no forward movement. And then I just feel like more shit because now I'm like stuck at that, right? And so the idea of One Life Connected is to say, yeah, I mean, just, Take that one step. You don't have to eat right all the time. You know, what if your one balloon is to just go walk your dog and that's a balloon and that's a step. And that has actually helped people to realize that they don't have to attack every sink or every balloon all at once. It's just being able to make a small step that works for them in the moment while they're there. And I don't know why it works to be honest with you, but I've seen it. And um, I think that overwhelming feeling is something that I even get, even though I'm supposed to be in the Zen space. And I will fall back on the message because oftentimes when I get overwhelmed, I start name blaming and judging myself. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm blaming and judging myself. I need to stop. And what do I need to recognize where I'm at, embrace it, and then make that one step forward. And so even though we can't see all the mountains, we're able to take a step on mountain 10, knowing that mountain 20 will come in time. I don't know if that you know, answers the question, but I think the overwhelming feeling is learning how to give ourselves permission to realize we're not gonna live up to that idealistic vision. It's like giving ourselves permission to let go of not living up to that vision. Me, that really resonates, Kim. I was so excited about this conversation because I think we, everybody who's here today is a self-proclaimed overachiever who have extremely high expectations for what we should be able to manage. And I think it's very frustrating as a perpetual overachiever when you feel like you're not keeping up. Your own self-expectations are set so high um, that you begin to think, oh my gosh, what am I doing wrong? And like everybody is noticing that you're doing things wrong too. So I love this, this conversation keeps bringing you back to a center, bringing you back to a place of safety where you can almost reset and then venture out into the world again. That really resonated with me. Yeah, and you know, like we were joking around at the beginning before everybody got on. I'm not kidding. I have had to come to grips with the fact that over the last two months, I've had some major sinkers develop in my life and supporting others while they're dealing with some major events in their lives. And so honestly, deadlines are a suggestion to me. Does that make me a bad human being? No, it doesn't. And I had to let go of that idealistic vision that because I missed a deadline, that I'm not a bad person, you know what I mean? And, and these two can attest to it. I missed deadlines with them. <laughs> and they're like, could you send this? I'm like, oh yeah, 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 I'll get to it, I'll get to it, I'll get to it. And I always feel like I'm coming up with an excuse, but it's just like you were saying, Andrea, I was just overwhelmed. I mean, I'm one person, I'm trying to manage a movement and, and some, I'm not gonna share what the major events were, but they were very major. And I was in, engrossed with some of my friends related to those. and you know, life, life happens. And um, I think each of us, it's such an individualized path that there's no way for us to know. And so that's one of the things that I like about the framework is it doesn't tell you how to do it or what to do it. It just says, you're a normal human being that you think. You're a normal human being that you go to name blame judge. And you have permission to embrace that sinker and that balloon and find what you need to stay connected. And that means connecting with your joy, your pain. It means connecting with yourself, connecting with humanity, connecting with all of the pieces of the shame ocean, not just the balloons and knowing what that means for you. 
and, and that sometimes means working with therapists, counselors, coaches. It means uh, doing the hula, I don't know, whatever that space is for you. And so, go ahead, someone's gonna say something? No. So when we each start on this space, uh, one of the stories I always share with people is when I, I run Tough Mudders and this one Tough Mudder, there's a picture of me in this tunnel. And, and what Tough Mudders are, are 10, 10 to 12 mile military style obstacle courses. And I, many of the obstacles for me are mental, not so much physical. And so you go through this tiny tunnel where you have to be on your hands and knees. And at the top of the tunnel, you drop into five feet or you drop about two feet into five feet of water. But because you're going through head first, you have to drop into the water with your face or with your back. And you really want to drop in with your feet because you can't see the bottom and no one likes to jump into water head first when you can't see the bottom. And so it's really a mental game. And I do it, but I come out and I actually do have scrapes and bruises because of my contact points in the, in the gravel and the rocks in the tunnel. And my husband's behind me and he's my same height, but he's so much broader in his shoulders that he has to do an army crawl through the tunnel. So even though he's easily able to make it up, he has different contact points. And that's just it. So when we get out, we have bruises, but they're all in different places. Exact same tunnel, completely different wounds and completely different ways of how we managed it. And that wasn't a realization for me was that we were getting all of these things that people were saying here's how to fix yourself this is what you're supposed to do and because i wasn't a triathlete i felt like a loser you know what i mean and then and then and then i realized there actually is a space before we start making our own balloons or connecting to our our sinker there's a space that gives us permission to let go of that idealistic vision to realize that we don't need to be perfect and to start that one step as andrea said at a time and so as you start going through this process, what do you think comes up for people as they start embracing the ideas of the concepts? What do you think they will ask a lot about or request um, advice on? Is it, I mean, I don't want to speak up, but I'll, I'll break the ice here. Yeah, okay. Comparative thing? Do people start to compare themselves to how others managed or dealt with the adversity? Comparative is a common one. Yeah, that can, that can show up. Like, well, that person does triathletes. I'll just put that out as an example because I actually had a friend who walked out of a com uh, a conference lecture and said, "I'm not a triathlete, so I suck." So yeah, there was comparison of how these people are doing it. So I'm supposed to be like this. And so it actually gave them permission to realize that their journey is unique, right? So they don't have to be a triathlon and that actually is that person's balloon. So yeah, it, it kind of normalized the comparative piece. And then also do, in that same space of comparative being, well, their sinker is so much bigger than my sinker. So I should just be okay with this. Like, why am I complaining? you realize, well, that scratch is your scratch, even though it's not in your mind as important as their scratch, it is your scratch and you have permission to embrace that scratch. So yeah, the, the, the comparative piece started to normalize a little bit. What else? Everybody's so quiet. No ideas? I know you're all thinking. I know you guys are thinking. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. So as people start looking at the framework and they're really starting to understand that idea of embracing their sinkers, embracing their balloons and moving away from that name, blame, judge, cynical, angry place. And they're trying to find that space to stay connected. What do you think they come to me most commonly looking for advice or um, direction on how to overcome the next step, to take that next step as Andrea was talking about, to not feel overwhelmed, to be able to take that next step. What's the most common, more common things that they usually come to me for advice on? I don't know what other people go through, but for me, it's letting go. It's really hard to let go of how other people see me. So it's really hard not to be the person to say yes to everything 
um, and I'm letting other people down when because they rely on me. So when I say, oh, I can't take that on, it's, it's really difficult. So that's a huge step for me is to help reframe how other people see me. Okay. Yeah, no, I think that um, people pleasing and that framing please is, is a common, that's a big one for me. I'll, I'll agree. And so I had to go through an activity of, you know, stating I'm going to disappoint people every day and that's okay, you know? <laughs> and how do I embrace that spot of disappointing people? So I think we have um, two minutes left to kind of wrap things up, but I wish I had an answer for you, Jamie, to tell you exactly what you need. I think the piece that I want to leave everybody with is what the movement leaves you with is that you have permission to find that space for you. You have permission to find that area to help you recognize that you don't have to be at all for everybody. And one of the ways that I helped embrace that was to recognize that when people disappoint me, I don't hate them. I don't disregard them. And so I've had to work with self-compassion, which is that there's a lot of resources out there to help me embrace that part of myself. And so getting to that point where I said deadlines are a suggestion to me is really hard because that means I'm disappointing people, right? And it's not like I enjoy it, but I've actually come to grips with that. It doesn't define who I am. So I really think that this is the starting point and this I shared the framework with you the, the next one is really going to dive into the North Star that the One Life Connected community has created, which helps in Jamie's point and how to stay on that path as you start this process in this journey. And it's, it's something, there's a video on my website that you can watch, but we're going to talk about it in more depth on the next one. But I hope that you have a little bit of a tickle in your brain about what One Life Connected looks like and how it basically is creating that space that gives us permission to start the path to our own sustainability, whether it's in this industry or outside. And I recently did an event that was with non-veterinarians and it definitely resonated with them as well. So thank you very much, you guys. I know we're at our 25 minute mark, so I'm happy to stay for an after party and answer any questions that you guys have. Yep. So yes, as, as common with the Bridge Club, those of you who must leave, now we, we've reached our time that we told we promised we'd stick with, but we will be talking a little bit longer. So if you'd like to hang around, um, hear more from Kim or have some specific questions for her, let's hang around for another 10 minutes or so and continue the conversation. And then before everybody leaves, um, part two is on Thursday. So um, if you've not already signed up, you might wanna go check it out on the website. You can register directly from the Bridge Club's website and um, come talk some more and we'll get into actually how we do it, I guess a little bit more um, on Thursday too. So we will carry on now. If you need to drop off, just go ahead and do so quietly and thanks for, thanks for being here. So questions, anybody have a question or, or something Kim said that is really resonating that you wanna dig into a little bit more? I just wanna, oh, go ahead. Um, I thought one of the best lines I heard at AVMA was, no is a complete sentence. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. I know that's hard. No. I mean, like, you know, I got this going on. I, no, no, no. No is good. Just no. <laughs> yeah, it's hard though, right, Eric? <laughs> so. Andrew, yeah. 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 The thing that I heard today that resonated the most was give yourself permission. Like just be the one to step up and say, it's okay that you don't need to get that from someone else. You don't need to get someone else's permission. It's you can give that to yourself. And I, I appreciated hearing that today. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah, I think that was one of the most eye-opening points. And I don't know if you've read the book. I have a book called The Unspoken Life. And I basically talk about how I almost took my life and I, and I stopped myself. It was that that stopped me. It was that I'm the only one that can give myself permission to take a different path. Yeah. I don't want to go this path I'm going because it's not the way I really want to go. So I have to not wait for someone to tell me how to do it 
or give me permission. I have to give myself permission. I still don't know what the path is, but I'm, I'm going to start. And that, and that was the first step, the first step in the stone. I gave myself permission. Didn't mean it was all rainbows and unicorns though, Andrea. So like <laughs> everything was like, Ooh, beautiful. <laughs> no, it just meant, okay, I took the first step. Yeah. Now what? <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. It's funny, I think, you know, for, for those people who are planner types, you know, as you were saying earlier, we plan out our future. We think it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, right? And then a left turn comes. And mm -hmm. it really causes you when you are a type A and you're a planner to step back and just go like, okay, darn, wait a minute, now what, right? And to have to start again takes a lot of energy. I, I totally admire that you were able to pull yourself back from a much darker place, I think, than I've ever been. So that's um, thank goodness you did. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, I'm, I'm very happy I did. And, but I also know how to still connect with that space, which, which some people say, you know, like I still have the pill vial from that day. And they're like, well, isn't that such a negative thing? I go, no, actually I'll never be in that space again, but I will always feel that feeling. That feeling never really goes away within me. It's always there. Um, and I recently had to uh, work with somebody who had a loss of close uh, friend to uh, suicide and we were talking and they were trying to understand that space of suicide and I basically told them you know there's that space that I was in that day and then now there's this space that I see from the other side of watching you in pain and the thing is watching you in pain doesn't change the space that I was in that day and I know that's hard to understand but I have to embrace this space of where I was that day in order to move forward. And it doesn't matter what other people go through, I have to give myself permission to embrace myself. And I uh, wish I could do that for everybody, but I can't. So what I've done is create a space that gives them permission to find their own path. And it basically, what I hear people say is, one life connected makes me feel that I'm not broken and that I don't need to be fixed and that I'm not alone. And, and I can start moving forward, whatever that might be. And sometimes I, don't even, sometimes I don't even know what people have done. I'll just get an email from them six months after they saw a lecture and they'll be like, I went to your lecture, you know, you changed my life. I didn't change their life. I just tickled their brain and then they changed their lives. You know what I mean? And they said, I heard this message and I went out and I did this, this, and this, and this, and now I'm not going to be a statistic. I have heard people say that to me more times than not. And I'm not looking for that affirmation. What that tells me is that the message is allowing them to find that path. It is, it's opening up that door for them so that they realize that they, they can do this. They don't need someone to do it for them. Even for people who are like to totally in happy spaces, it's nice to know that it's okay to give yourself that permission. Like you said, I mean, I, you know, I don't know the situation of everybody here who's with us today, right? We all have dark days. We all, all have really happy days though. But to me, the, the, uh, something that really resonated too was just the powerful idea of giving yourself permission to just be in that moment. If you're mad, be mad. If you're happy, be happy. If you are angry, be angry but then give yourself permission again to move on from that particular space too. So just, you know, curious to know from everybody else who's here. Have you, I mean, have you felt that way too? I know it's not just me. Well, there's a, there's a quote out there by Viktor Frankl who survived the Holocaust that says that which is to give light must endure burning. And so it's exactly to what you're saying. You're going to burn. You're going to have anger. You're going to have sadness, resentment, frustration, um, fill in whatever negative emotion you have, but you can't have those without, you can't have the light, you can't have the joy, the happiness, the contentment without the other. And so it's not labeling them as bad and good, it's just holding them both and saying, I have sinkers, I have balloons, and I'm going to walk with both of them. The beauty of well being, right? Yeah. Well being yeah. is not always well. It's not about putting rosy glasses on and putting a silver lining around everything. That's not how it works. You can't reframe anything and everything into a positive. You know, if my animal dies unexpectedly, I can't make that, well, I've learned this from that. I mean, that just sucks, period. And I need to be okay with sitting with that and letting me allow that time. Good stuff.
down. All right, so we are at 12.03, 12.03 Philadelphia time, I guess I will say anyway. So we're, <laughs> uh, yes, we're, we're about 10 minutes past our designated stop time. So opportunity for final questions or comments from anybody. And then we'll ask Kim to leave us with the last thought and we'll hope that you decide to come see us again on Thursday. Kim, any final thoughts to leave us with today? Well, I think it was great to be able to see everybody. Um, it kind of makes it a little bit more fun than just like staring into the nothing world <laughs> when you do webinars sometimes and you're like looking at that green dot going, I have no idea if anybody gets what I'm saying or whatever. And yet I can see some nodding, but I appreciate all of you coming on here. You know, I don't have all the answers. Um, I'm very clear on that when I lecture, but what I do is try and create that space that gives us this first step to be able to not feel overwhelmed, to be able to feel comfortable saying no, and that it is a complete sentence, to be able to be comfortable with change, to not feel like we have to control everything. And so the next lecture that we're gonna engage in is really looking at the North Star that we've created as the community and how we use that as our, our point, just like we use the veterinary oath to keep us moving forward. Thank you, everybody, for coming and spending time with us today. Thank you, Kim. Looking forward to Thursday. So cheers, everyone. Go on out and have a really fabulous day. Cheers. Bye. Thank you.